Hello, Hello, ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen this, this is Alice from, from Beijing. Beijing. I'm, I'm so, so glad to meet you again. again. I can have to talk. This every Friday is talk. We have many, 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 many audience, audience from all over the world. world. So, so I'm, I'm proud of uh, this, this program was connected to the universe by the scientific talk. So this week is a great week. This week we have very great speakers here. Yeah, we have two speakers. One is Dr. Chen from MIT. Another one is Zhenlan Bao from Stanford. University. We, we have two great hosts here, here too. We, we have a Zhu Gang Su from Harvard University. Everyone knows that he gave a wonderful talk several weeks, weeks ago. ago. It's really attractive for his, you know, eye jokes. jokes. And, and Paul Wicks is from UCLA. He also delivered a very nice talk you know, at the beginning of I can act. So uh, he came back often, you know, to charge on the stage and uh, is a wonderful hosters. So today we're going to have a uh, wonderful talk and wonderful hosters. I couldn't wait in for all of them. So I will give the stage to Professor Zhi Gang Su to introduce our first speaker, Gang Chen. Yeah, Zhi Gang, please. Hey, Professor thank Su. you. Thank you, Alice. Hey, everyone. Um, Good, good day. Um, so today, the first talk, this is a wonderful um, I Can X um, uh, talk. Um, today's first speaker is uh, Gang Chen, Professor Gang Chen. So most people know Gang Chen. Gang Chen, just a terrific guy. I have uh, the privilege to know him personally for decades. Um, just a, such a devotion to friendship and devotion to his uh, work and devotion to his uh, family. Just, just a wonderful human being. Uh, but I'll read um, uh, this uh, uh, bio. Uh, Gang Chen is uh, Carl uh, Richard Roderberg, Professor of Power Engineering at MIT. Uh, in, for five years, uh, he served as a head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Uh, he is a director of a research center founded by US uh, Department of Energy. He obtained his doctorate degree from UC Berkeley uh, under another famous Chinese professor. Um, what, what was his name? Uh, Gang Chen? Gang? Gang Ningtian. Yeah, right, she's a senior moment. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> uh, very famous. Uh, he, um, uh, now this is important. He obtained a master and, um, and a bachelor degree from Huazhong University, uh, Huazhong University of Science and Technology. He was also devoted to that university as well. She's just, uh, just a wonderful human being. Uh, he, before joining MIT, he was a faculty member at Duke University and UCLA. Uh, he has had enormous number of uh, young people trained in his lab, 70 MS and PhD candidates and, uh, and uh, 60 postdocs, nearly 50 of his former PhD students and postdocs are in faculty position uh, worldwide, unbelievable. He received an NSF Young Investigator Award, an R&D 100 Award, an ASME Heat Transfer Memorial Award, and, and Frank Kreef Energy Award, and, and many other awards, very long section. Let, let's uh, just, just uh, um, now he is a member of, um, uh, of uh, US um, National Academy of Engineering and a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Gong Chen, wonderful person, please go ahead. Also wonderful speaker, please. Thank you, Zhi Gang. It's uh, such a great honor to have you preside in uh, my talk. Good morning from Boston, good evening, and good day. And I also want to thank Alex, you're so energetic, and uh, you are making researchers into movie stars. 
So actually today I have a chance uh, to speak to this audience. Uh, at the end, I will show a movie that we made, we tried before. Maybe this is the time we're going to shine. And today, this spring. Oh, oops. okay, sorry. Let me go to the front. We're just trying this. So today I'll actually tell you some stories that uh, during the process of uh, exploration of uh, heat, energy, and water, really from nanoscale to macro scale. And those stories, I call these are my explorers, those are the students and postdocs that uh, with whom I had a really great pleasure to work with. So speaking about heat, it's a little bit dull, right? We deal with it every day, but we take it for granted. So what's new there? I want to actually start with the story myself. And uh, uh, in 1980, I was admitted by Huazhong University of Science and Technology at the time, Huazhong Institute of Technology. And uh, many people knew that at the time, they, uh, there are only a few percent of students uh, admitted to college, right? And so I was very excited. I called my father and uh, his first question was, what's your major? Uh, I didn't know because at the time we applied for major, but most of us were assigned different majors. So I read the mission letter to my father. I said, it's thermal power plant. And my father said, oh, too bad. You will be a boiler maker. So that's how I get into heat involuntarily, but as uh, my knowledge grows, I start to really fall in love with it. And uh, there's a reason here. Here is a really strong reason because heat is intrinsically related to, it's part of the energy, right? And if we look at, this is actually US energy consumption chart. On the left are the different form of heat input. So you can say, let me get my cursor, laser pointer here, and solar energy, nuclear, hydro, wind, uh, geothermal, natural gas, coal, biomass, and petroleum. So other than hydro and the wind, which account for about 6%, and solar is 1%, but solar is a heat source 6,000 degree. Kelvin. So pretty much all the energy input of a society is first converted into heat. And then we use it to generate electricity or to drive uh, automobiles. And if we look at the, how efficient we're using it, we only use about 33%. And we're throwing out 67%. So I start to understand that my job was guaranteed by second law of thermodynamics. My, we have a lot of laws, but say this is the lecture law that guarantee your job. So I dive into this and uh, I'll tell you some of the new things that we're trying to work in the area of heat. But of course, those things are really done by our students and postdocs, so I'll tell their story. Talk about Lucent, we of course need to review what are the oceans, right? So let's start with this three modes of heat transfer that we all learned, either in elementary school or middle school or high school or college, somewhere we learn, right? Three modes of heat transfer, and then we experience every day, the conduction, convection, radiation. For each of these three modes, there are three, say they, they're very famous person associated with describing the fundamental transport process. So those are the conduction is Joseph Fourier, convection is Asher Newton, and radiation is Max Planck. And those, of course, 
are the series laid, the foundation laid down a long time ago. And I will tell a few stories today that when we go to nano, it turns out that this traditional, say, classical theory, well, not really necessarily classical, but say the theory fails. Right? We can break the laws they established. And so those, as I mentioned, are done by former students and postdocs. Those are some of the, now the everybody on the picture, let's say on the, on, the, on the slides here. And really I can pick up any of them, tell you a very long story, but we only have an hour. So I'm going to tell a few of their stories. So those are the people I'm going to mention and I know I have some students, postdocs uh, online. If I don't tell your story, it doesn't mean you have, say you don't have an exciting story. It's just a time. So let me start from Max Planck, thermal radiation. And uh, Max Planck uh, had a theory to expand this so-called black body. Black body is one that we consider in thermal radiation given a temperature that's a maximum amount of radiation, it can come out of any object. And in fact, uh, when Planck explained the black body experimental curve, right, different wavelengths, different temperature have different intensity, he had to introduce the idea of energy quanta. So thermal radiation is the electromagnetic wave, and he had to introduce that even if electromagnetic wave, the energy is discontinuous. And then Einstein came in further say this uh, discontinuity actually has momentum. So that's the start of quantum mechanics. We're not going to talk much, but the explanation of thermal radiation has everything to do with the modern theory of uh, understanding of matter. But when we do research, it's very important to go back to original thinkers and see, well, how do you think, think right? And in fact, Max Planck was pretty clear that he said that his theory is only valid when the geometry, space, radius curvature considered a large compared to the wavelengths of the radiation, uh, rays considered. Rays means radiation, right? So that was uh, at the turn of last century. And uh, after his theory, there are other theory developed oh, indeed you can go beyond the Planck's law. There is something here I need to get rid of. I really couldn't say. I'm okay. So this is the this is the calculation. This was theory developed in 1950 to 70s and uh, Basically, it shows here is 100 micron, and that's about the diameter of human human hair. And when we, if we have two surfaces, 100 micron away, black body radiation, that's a limit. But when we, the two surface get to one micron, you can see you can actually go beyond the black body curve. And if you can go to 30, 10 nanometer, you can exceed the black body by four orders magnitude. So this is a actual calculation for two pieces of silicon, uh, silica, glass, two pieces of glass. And the reason is near the surface of this glass, there are additional surface wave that decay exponentially. So only when the surface get close, this wave can actually go from one side to the other. Otherwise they just die down. And that's the reason. So this theory has been there for a long time. And there were no experiment. There are some attempt to do the experiment, but no conclusive data that we, you can really exceed the black body radiation law. So then Oxford came in. The first one was Luhu, who is now at ExxonMobil. And then we brainstormed how we can do experiment to show we can exceed the Planck's law. And one idea that worked is that's, we bought some very smooth surface, optically flat. And then we use this plastic sphere micron to as a spacer to separate the two sides and keep these two surfaces parallel. 
And this uh, is about a one micron. So uh, if we use a very few of them and all we calculate the heat conduction is no problem. And we do experiment in vacuum. So we avoid the conduction, avoid the re uh, convection. And the experiment they show here is a black body curve. And the below, when they're far apart, we are falling below it. But the once the gap is about one micron, the red dots above the curve. That's great. So we can exceed the Planck's law. But we couldn't go smaller because they, once you go smaller, somehow, somewhere, the surface touch each other. So we hit the wall. And Lou, in this case, said, I can't work on something else. I like to work on renewable energy. So I said, oh, yeah, why don't you look into nanowire solar cell? That's actually, say, he wrote the first paper there, uh, simulation to say this is good for light trapping. And later on, it, we developed a line of research based on his work. So that's good. And uh, uh, one of the lessons uh, we uh, you hear often in research, we also be flexible. We have new opportunities. So we hit the walls, so we change. But we haven't forgot this problem. So we have a second explorer. This is Arvan Narayan Swami, who is now associate professor at Columbia University. Uh, of course, we tried many methods, and the, I call this an immense one. Uh, say idea. And the idea is, that, well, we use a smaller surface area because when it's too large somewhere, there's a piece of dust and they're not parallel. We say, okay, maybe we can cr use the crack in the material because the crack, when the material crack at the gap must be very small and they are self parallel. And then we put them apart and uh, measure the radiation transfer. And I would spend half a year, didn't work. So I'm very disappointed. But one day he came to me very excited. He said, I got, I got a new idea. And the new idea is to use atomic force microscope. And this is a AFM cantilever you can buy commercially. And then you glue a small sphere, about 50 micron. And this way, we don't have to deal with parallel plate anymore because a sphere, there's always a point in the front approaching the surface. And then he used a, a AFM cantilever because it has been shown before in literature that with this two layer, it's a very sensitive temperature sensor. And that's because the thermal expansion difference and uh, the small temperature change will bend the cantilever. So we knew everything, but I didn't come up with the idea. Arvin came up with the idea. And once I hear this, I say, this will work because when you move this cantilever close to the surface, the cantilever temperature change a little bit and when they're bending, we can measure it. But even with this, it's not always straightforward. That's a traditional way of doing using AFM, but it turns out that when you get closer, they uh, slap onto the surface because the force uh, is very strong and we just turned this 90 degrees. So Arvind was very happy the experiment worked, published a paper and Columbia uh, extended the offer uh, to him. And before he leave, he passed this to another student. This is Shen Shen. So, so here is the lesson, right? Failure is a matter of success. We all learned that. And uh, Shen Shen now is a, a professor at the Carnegie Mellon University. We continue the experiment and demonstrate indeed uh, when we get to 30 nanometer, we exceed the black body radiation law by three orders of magnitude. I'll tell a uh, more story about Shen Shen later on. And this caught a lot of attention. MIT uh, had a Lewis report. Here is the Planck's law of black body radiation and uh, the title is a break of no at the nanoscale. So one picture worth a thousand words. And this was, a, you can say it's 10 years ago, we are still working on it. And the problem we're working on is what happens between contact at one nanometer. And this is because it turns out there are about four order magnitude change at this region. And there are no theory 
and no conclusive experiments. So working actually with a group of people into this. So that's the radiation story, Planck's law. Let's look into conduction. And then when we talk about conduction, we go back to Joseph Fourier, who was 90 years older than Max Planck. In 1822, he wrote an article on the analytical theory of heat. So he, in that, he described laid the foundation for heat conduction, where basically we know when one side, uh, one side is hot, the other side is cold, there's a conduction inside the material. And then he say the heat flux is proportional to local temperature gradient. And the proportionality constant is a material property, thermal conductivity. And the, if you don't know this, but you know the Fourier series. If you're an engineer, uh, learn mathematics, and the Fourier series we learn them in solving differential equations. In fact, I say electric engineer using this. So it all came from the anal analysis of the theory of heat. And that's a heat because he had to solve the equation he developed his Fourier analysis method. And now we understand at the time didn't, right? The microscopic picture of this is a really random walk. The heat conduction is actually a random walk process. So let me explain a little bit. So my body is hot, air molecule hit my surface. And uh, because it's hotter, so they get a higher velocity and they collide with the laboring air molecule. And that's how the heat is conducted out. It's a random motion of air molecule. And the distance between this motion, we call the mean free pass. And uh, this mean free pass in air is about 100 nanometer. Very, very small, right? Human here, as I mentioned, is 100 micron, 10,000 times larger. So in this room, there's no problem. For real, the condition is that the distance for heat conduction must be larger. Otherwise, this random walk picture is not valid. And in fact, I'll show experimentally uh, that this Fourier law fails. And before that, and let me just talk a little bit about thermal conductivity because uh, this actually shows the challenge when we work on the material. And the challenge is nature was, is not very generous. So it gave the material property in terms of heat is only five orders magnitude. So the best insulator is air and uh, the best heat conductor is diamond. And in fact, the between diamond and the next one is copper. Diamond is about 2000 and uh, copper is 400. There are not many material in between. So we've been doing a lot of work in this domain and uh, some really exciting progress. And for example, this year we report this by enriching boron in cubic boron lipide, we get thermal conductivity of 1600. And this turns out to be the less material uh, the material next to diamond. And the two, so uh, two years ago, we found, we thought that was a material, just the second best heat conductor, that's a boron arsenide. And uh, uh, so there really not a progress in finding materials to fill in the gap between copper and diamond. And those materials, some of them are semiconductor, like boron arsenide, the semiconductor. So really have a lot of potential application in electronics. And then we're working on it. But I want to tell you later a story how we engineer material artificially, right? Plastic is an insulator, heat insulator, but how we can turn it into a good heat conductor. I'll tell you uh, how we think and how we eventually demonstrate that. And we also work on a lot, see how we turn a good heat conductor into a good thermal insulator. And today I don't have time to talk. So, what made this possible really is one slide. Uh, there are a lot of progress over the last uh, uh, decade. And uh, one progress is now we can do quantum mechanical calculation of the thermal conductivity. And you can say given material, the silicon, uh, germanium, gamma arsenide, all this uh, well-known material. And uh, you can actually compare theory and calculation and they fall right on top of each other. I'm very amazing. The second is the measurement. Measuring heat is extremely hard. 
but their good development optical method. So we can measure small sample, thin films, nano wires. So we don't have to wait for material scientists to perfect the material to measure because uh, the traditional method always require a large piece of material. And this is actually a really good example where uh, you can see this, the, uh, this was actually 2018. The boron arsenide was predicted to have a good heat conduction and uh, uh, by the density function theory. And then there is a, a program launched to actually demonstrate this. And in one issue of science, there are three articles to demonstrate that indeed this is true. And we, we work on that. But that's what I want to say about the new progress. And let me come back to the Fourier law, right? To demonstrate the failure. And this was actually a surprise uh, discovery, experimental discovery made by Austin Millen. So Austin is now a professor at Caltech and uh, he did an experiment that, that uh, was surprising. And uh, basically I said that we use a laser to do a measurement and the, he measured silicon. We all know silicon property. This is what the literature, but he first say this is smaller and uh, then the literature to measure. And in fact, he found that that depends on the side diameter of the laser beam can measure different value. That's a really strange. It's the same piece of material, right? And uh, his first experiment was only done up to 80 Kelvin. And then he started to see some difference. And then he think, I think he knew what's going on. He came to me, said whether he could do to lower temperature. I said, go ahead. And then indeed, when you go to lower temperature, you see bigger and a bigger difference. In fact, when I saw this, I said, he knew it, I knew it. I said, aha, I've been looking for this. I didn't know how to do the experiment before. So it turns out that years ago, I wrote a paper basically saying that if you have a heat source, heat goes out by conduction and the underlying material, in this case, silicon, right? In silicon, their lattice vibration, atom vibration, we call that phonon. And they also have mean free paths, just like air gas, uh, say uh, air molecules. So the theory I had prediction is if your heat source is larger than the mean free paths and you have the Fourier law value, but if you make the heat source very small, uh, then heat, uh, there's no scattering, no collision because this is smaller than the mean free paths. So the Fourier law is not valid, it's ballistic. Principle. And uh, simple scanning happens. So this is a mean free pass comparable with the diameter of heat source. And since that, predicting their experiments tried by different groups, and uh, there are signs of that. And then we also tried very hard, uh, but it didn't work until Austin's discovery. So that was a surprise, but also we knew. Uh, once we saw it, right? discovery often made unexpected and the curiosity really say, made this happen. And so this, what this led to is a way to measure different material mean free paths. And uh, Austin, uh, and this measurement actually make us comparable uh, to the first principle density function theory calculation. Austin did the initial work and uh, then another uh, postdoc, uh, Yung Jae Hu came on board and uh, demonstrated that he, because this one optically he can only focus light to a small uh, diameter, but Yung Jae developed a very ingenious design so that we can push experiment, he was small to 20 nanometer. And that way we can really map out the mean free pass and compare the dash lines density function theory experiment is what we infer of the material. And this is uh, uh, interesting because typically to do this kind of experiment, you need to go to national labs. So they have synchrotron source, but now we can do it just on desktop. And Yunji, I want to say he was a postdoc with his very different background. His background was chemistry. He did his PhD in Harvard uh, measuring electron transport. And then when he joined my group to do heat conduction, that was a completely new field but 
he really was brave to dive in and now really is a leader in this field. So I want to next show a slide from Austin Minute. Every group member, when they leave my group, they, I ask them to give an exit talk to share their experience. And Austin surprises me with this slide. He showed a slide of his mood during PhD. And you can see his ups and downs. Green is good mood, red is bad mood. And he was a nice guy, I never noticed that. Uh, but you, it shows the see research, you go up and down, that's very common. And I won't say you don't have to be bad mood, right? but uh, uh, you can see he was very happy. He said, probably first paper in first year. And that's always my sort of motivation to student. That's a learning process you give them a well-defined paper. And uh, he also said he had no idea what I'm doing for a few years, right? He packed your paper during this. But the reason is that as a student matures, right, learn research, coming up with a new idea is most difficult. And uh, you eventually came up through this writing papers, doing research, he came up with a new idea and he starts say the experiment encouraging. But even that, your equipment break down, you couldn't repeat, and you eventually could repeat the reproducing data get a good job. So that's a good story, good ending there. But research is a very arduous process. And next I want to share a story of another student. And this is uh, Ashagan Henry, uh, who is now my colleague. And he came to me, he said, I want to simulate atom moving. I said, aha, that's molecular dynamics. I never had a student want to do that simulation. I had a postdoc, Sebastian Woods, whom I worked with. He actually taught me molecular dynamics. So I told the Ashi, I said, I never read a code, but I know what I, uh, see. It is, I'm glad to discuss, I know what I want to see. So he took on that challenge. And he did a thesis, first the master thesis, work on silicon variable non-material. In fact, the Austin experiment that was related to that. And then for his PhD, he came back to me. He said, I want to work on carbon nanotube. I said, no, 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 carbon nanotube. That was 10 years ago discovered and uh, uh, we're too late in the game. I suggest him look into polymer. So from carbon nanotube to polymer, that seems to be a big difference. And the reason for me was I got a call from Intel and at the time cell phone was a plastic packaging. And uh, the Intel uh, a friend asked whether I have idea on thermal management. I looked at the cell phone and I said, well, I see two problems. So one is battery, the other is thermal management. Those two problems, even we change into uh, now metal packaging, right? It's still having those problems. But at the time I was thinking how I could turn plastic spread out the better the heat generated by the battery, electronics. And uh, normally people would say, okay, you got plastic, you will uh, add another good material because plastic is a, a heat insulator. And then we ask the question, is a plastic really intrinsically a bad insulator? Is a molecule a bad heat insulator? So you go to plastic, I'm not a chemist, Paul uh, uh, is a chemist, and later on Zilan is a chemist. And this is what I know about polymer, right? Polyethylene, the molecule is a carbon-carbon bond. And in fact, it's a straight carbon-carbon bond if you see a, a molecule there, right? And if you look at the carbon nanotube, we see this is also carbon-carbon bond. And the people say carbon nanotube could have better heat conduction than diamond even. So maybe polyethylene could be a really good heat conductor. And in fact, uh, it could be a heat in a super conductor. That is crazy to think about that. And, but we have a reason to think about that. And this was uh, from famous Enrico Fermi. And in 1955, they published a memo 
and they said we made a remarkable liter discovery. And what is their discovery? At the time, computer was powerful enough to do some simulation, and they started a one-dimensional atomic chain, so different atoms along the line, and they found that the energy doesn't equal partition, follow equal partition. So what does it mean? So let me explain this. We got a sheet of paper. I lock that at, you say vibration, and you ensure that vibration dies down, the energy is dissipated into all the vibrational modes in the paper. And that's the equipartition. But this is not a case in one dimensional atomic chain. So they put the energy in one mode, they interact with the other modes. Those are the energy going as a function of time. But what they found is that energy doesn't equipartition. They come back to the same mode. And the implication is one dimensional structure could have infinite thermal conductivity. A lot of physicists studied that for the sake of the fundamental theory. But I ask Asher, I say, is a molecule, could a molecule behave like that? A polyethylene molecule, which is 60% plastics. And they worked on that. And indeed, show a plastic a molecule could be, say, infinite heat conduction. And this is a theory. People are still trying to prove it. And, but even when we take out of those uh, diverging mode, we still know that polyethylene could have very high thermal conductivity. Normal plastic is only about 0.2. And this one say we can get a few hundred. So it gave us motivation to try experimentally. Ashi, by the way, after he graduated, he uh, was actually before that, he was offered a job, faculty job at the Georgia Tech. But he was very smart. He pushed that back to two years. He went to postdoc. He started APAE uh, Energy uh, Agency, New Energy Agency uh, fellow. And uh, and from there, he after he joined Georgia Tech, he built the experiment. Although during uh, his PhD, he never done an experiment. He actually break a world record. That he had a, a pump that can pump liquid metal at 1400 degree. Uh, two days ago, I was at a student thesis committee, and they actually now elevate that over 2,000 degrees. It's really this day more Guinness World uh, Record. It's so good, so we attracted him back to MIT a few years ago. But continue on polymer. And uh, this motivates us, well, we should do experiment. How to do experiment? We are not chemists, so we took a brutal force weight. Let's try to pull polymer straight. We couldn't do a single polymer, so we start polyethylene, and this is where Shen Shen I mentioned came in again. And uh, uh, he was working on AFM continuum measuring near field radiation, break the punk slope, right? And uh, uh, he, in fact, uh, before that, he was working on destroy fluid mechanic problem because the company came us uh, came to to us and say the disc head and disc uh, magnetic disc head for storage and the magnetic disc they had a one nanometer problem in predicting the height the flying height and he was working on. So I asked Shen, I said, why you work, want to work on different problem? And he said, oh. Near field was Alvin's idea, right? Original idea. I want to have something that's an original. And this is a, where his original idea, where we pull a nanofiber uh, and then directly attach to AFM cantilever and use it to measure heat conduction. And in fact, he worked with another undergrad student and we demonstrated, yeah, we can get to over 100 watt meter Kelvin. What it means is this is about 500 times better than original plastic and it's better than most metals. And after this, we got a lot of email, phone calls and people wanted, I remember there was once a NASCAR uh, email say, we're NASCAR championship team. I would like, we want your material. We say, sorry, it's a nanofiber. You can't see it, can you measure it? It doesn't help you right now for heat management yet. So what we need is to scale this up, right? We spent another 10 years to do so. And this is a, a, a mechanical stretching of polyethylene. And uh, so here's the original length 
but now after stretching, you can see meters long. And uh, it turns out the polymer self assemble into nano wires. And uh, those plastic sheet that we can get with thermal conductivity 60 is 300 times better than normal plastic. And I want to mention that we only published two papers over a period of 10 years. And uh, in academia, that's suicide. And luckily, those people work hard. You can see they all get pretty good jobs. And I will share a secret later on. So these are the, you can say Fourier is not valid, right? We show it's not valid. We take that fundamental understanding, trying to create something useful. And uh, I can tell you actually many stories on this, uh, but I'm not going to explain this. I just want to say that we have discovered working with, of course, that there are many other people in the field discover new regimes. So uh, the point is Fourier law, this is a blue region is where it's valid. And in a way you can think of this as the foundation for steam engine and this is foundation for air conditioning daily life. And so, but we have demonstrated that heat conduction have other regimes, right? Many other regimes. I mentioned some, you can check some of these papers. And some people say Fourier law is a stone age. I would say, okay, it's actually steam engine age. We move from steam engine, we walked out steam engine age to the information age. And the driver actually for us to study this is really developing better material for energy conversion, which is a topic, again, I'm not going to talk more, but I want to turn attention to a larger scale problem next. So let me, start with a, a story on building energy saving. And we were called upon by US Department of Energy and asking us whether we have ideas to save energy in building. And this is because buildings consume about one third of energy supply. And among this building energy input, over half of them are used for space heating and cooling. So you can say they, this is a chart that DOE showed us. And they say, if you, in the summer, rather than setting temperature 22 degree, you set to 26, 25 degree, you can save 15% energy. And then in winter, you dial the temperature lower, you can save similar amount of energy. So they ask us whether we have ideas. And I think one direction they are thinking is whether we can create something that we can wear and the cool body. And in fact, you can buy those, right? This is a, a website that you pass water flowing through the body. And uh, I've been working on semiconductor cooling. And this is also available. Some of the you probably have in the car, small refrigerator, right? That's a solid state cooling. And in fact, this was the MIT student team they now have a company, they have a product, and their idea is using this solid state semiconductor as a cooling. And then we did a calculation and say, this is not going to work for normal, uh, say when I sit there for several hours because of the efficiency is not high enough. And they have other application. Uh, so you can look at their website. So we're starting to ask whether we have new ideas. And uh, one, uh, question we say, can we take out the thermal radiation? Think about thermal radiation. And turns out that close, right? Is that the different temperature from a skin? As I said, the air is a good insulator. So between the skin and the clothes, there's a layer of air. You wear many layers in winter, you feel warm. And uh, so the skin is at a higher temperature. Can we read out that heat? And turns out close, is not transparent to infrared radiation. So our idea is let's look in the fabric itself. Let's make them infrared transparent, but still, of course, for obvious reason, visible the opaque. And uh, we did a simulation. Say this: if you can uh, have a sixty percent infrared transparent, you can uh, dissipate another twenty watt of heat. So when I sit here, I dissipate about eighty watts with another twenty watts. Uh, additional cooling, you'll feel 
cool and you can dial the air conditioning to a high temperature. So that was the idea and the, uh, the direction. And the question is how we do it. And we had a lot of discussion and we have to come up with a good idea to do it, right? We, in fact, the DOE had a call for proposals and then we see how we can have a winning idea. Eventually that idea emerged and they did, the idea is look at the wavelength difference. Visible light picks up 0.5 micron. This is because of Planck's black body radiation law. The sun is at 6,000 Kelvin and uh, the peak is at 0.5 micron. In fact, if you think that's a Max Planck work with Darwin. And the human body is at 300 Kelvin. So our peak radiation is 10 micron infrared. That's why in the light, we don't see it, right? And so whether an uh, object is transparent or opaque depends on two factors. Why is it absorbing? If, we, if the material doesn't absorb, but it's a highly scattering, you can still be opaque. So it turns out the scattering strength, this is a measured by scattering cross-section and the diameter very much related to diameter. Diameter to wavelength ratio here, when it's a one, so diameter is a comparable or larger wavelength, is a very strongly scattered. But when you make a diameter like 10 times smaller, the scattering drop by three order magnitude. And if we look at the, the current the fabric, here is 100 micron, and the, the diameter is a 10 to 50 micron range. And so for both the infrared and the visible, they are all highly scattered. So the idea becomes very simple. Let's make the diameter about one micron or smaller. And in that case, for infrared, it's about 0.1. And for visible, it's still here. And we can make the uh, infrared transparent. So we did a calculation and indeed say the simulation show here is this infrared transparent visible peg simulation. This is a visible range. This is infrared range, high transmittance. Those are the current fabric, cotton, polyester. You can say infrared, they are not transparent. So we bid for DOE project and they didn't give us money. It was a disappointment, but uh, we had done the work, so we published a paper, we applied patent. Jonathan Tong was actually undergraduate working with Shen Shen and uh, on polyethylene. That's to say, this is the material we work because it doesn't absorb. And uh, uh, after that, uh, uh, actually later material picked up and say, uh, you can make a cool clothes. But I also want to say the same idea uh, very often come from different groups. And Stanford, our Stanford friend Yi Cui had this uh, uh, with Shanghui Fang, and they actually got the DOE funding, wrote a better proposal, and uh, uh, they demonstrated a year later that uh, indeed that that's the case. And meanwhile, we'll work on this. And so this is additional thermal channel. And it turns out that by changing the diameter of fabric, we can make the either infrared transparent or infrared. Um, um, non-transparent. So we can make the either cooler and hotter and you can save materials. So this is a, uh, a say a example showing how we generate ideas. Next, I want to talk about the water. Water and energy are really too grand challenging for humanity. And right now there are about 4 billion people on earth, so it's more than half of the people suffer from water stress. So as global warming uh, become more and more, say the, the earth become hotter, the ice sheet melt and glacier melt, we will say have an even bigger challenge as the fresh water disappear. So I want to tell two stories on water. The first story came from a student, Anurag Bajpayee, and uh, he's now CEO of this company, Gradient Corporation. And he came to me uh, after he was admitted to MIT, he wanted to work with me. At the time I said, sorry, I don't have funding. So he went to work 
for a professor at Harvard Medical School. And for his PhD, he came back again. He said, I can't work with you. At the time I had funding, I said, oh yeah, welcome. So he joined my group. And uh, to get a PhD, we ha he had to pass a qualifying exam. He presented his research master thesis. Uh, he was doing cryogenic tissue preservation. So freeze the tissue and uh, later on saw it. And he said one problem was uh, water in the cell. And uh, because of water during freeze, they form ice, ice break the cell membrane. So to solve this problem, he used soybean oil to suck out the water. And uh, during the exam, we had another professor, John Linghard, and he was curious because he works on desalination. He said, that salt come out? And I said, no, salt doesn't come out. So we said, oh, that's good. That's your PhD thesis. So he developed during his PhD, the oil and the water desalination tank, direction solvent extraction. So the idea is simple. So you dump water into oil. They don't mix very well, so you form an emulsion and you heat up uh, the mixture and the clean water will go to oil and then heavy salty water droplets that you separate from the oil and then you cool down the uh, oil, precipitate the clean water back. So it's a very simple uh, process. He did the experiment, he found the better oil, he did a demonstration and published a paper. And then the scientific American, he told me, you know, this is going to be reported as a world changing idea. So Anurag is very good and he, he really wanted to change the world. But he also knew the tech, technology is still expensive compared to seawater desalination. So he uh, went to MIT Sloan Management School and they reached out to engineers and they have joint class looking into technology and see how to bring to market. And during that semester course, they actually found that, that fracking business. So this is uh, the oil and gas trapped in rocks. And uh, you frag the rock, fragment the rock and they come out. But water is also in the rock, right? And this water contains more salt, three to five times more salt than seawater. So there were no technology. The current technology doesn't work. Anurag go look at this market and got very excited. He actually lined up funding and worked with another student, John Linhart student, had another technology. So they licensed this out and started a gradient co cooperation. In fact, uh, John's technology was uh, faster to deployment. So they deployed that technology first. In fact, in the first uh, six months, uh, they signed an industrial contract, amazing speed. And they done very well. Uh, they now have business in US, in Asia and the Middle East. And uh, uh, so that's the uh, one story. They re research sometimes the idea come out of this discussion and the unexpected, right? Cryogenic tissue preservation to desalination. Let me tell you another unexpected story. This is another water story. This was actually uh, uh, my program manager from DOE sent me an email, uh, tell me, look at the other uh, uh, interesting paper. People dump nanoparticles into water and they report, uh, say under sunlight, there are bubbles around the particle and water is still cold. And we look at the mechanism, we say, uh, it turns out that it's not that boiling around each nanoparticle. But for what you want, it gave us a motivation to think, wow, Water is not good at absorbing sunlight. So sunlight goes to the bottom and heat up water very minutely, very slightly, right? But instead of doing that, let's float some absorber, pulse absorber on the surface. And then uh, in fact, uh, we can also put the insulator, thermal insulator between the absorber and the water to isolate so heat doesn't conduct leak out. And that way we can create a hot surface and the water sucked by capillary force, and then we can uh, say evaporate water much more efficiently. And indeed, this is the case. You can see this is a one sun condition, and this is a ten sun. You well, ten sun. You have to focus uh, uh, the concentrated light. But water is still cold, 
and uh, it's a very uh, easy experiment, easy demonstration. So uh, the uh, this was uh, uh, picked up by a lot of groups and a lot of high school students like that because you can do that science experiment, right? And dissemination is a motivation. And really for us, started with curiosity. And this is where I also want to say Hardy, who was a postdoc, and I told you that Polymer, we only published two papers in 10 years, right? So I got several postdocs that I said, well, that project we know it's very hard to publish. You need to think about the side project. So Hardy worked uh, his extra time and uh, jump on this opportunity and demonstrate this. Uh, so you can, you can evaporate water very efficiently. But I was still not satisfied because 10 times get to steam, I was fascinated about the idea how I can cook water because we need the electricity, we need the fuel, and uh, how I can do it under normal sun easily. And uh, George Nee, um, graduate student, came up with a new idea. And this is uh, uh, using, uh, he did a calculation, we can use the current uh, graphite we're using because it's uh, irradiated too much energy, conversion loses too much energy, more than what energy comes in. But we have this uh, solar hot water, right? And uh, in, fa in fact, this is uh, widely deployed in China. And they use this absorber, a uh, selective surface that really are the very small amount of heat. And then we put the cheap material like bubble wrap around. And that way we demonstrate even under normal Boston weather, so this is another thousand watt, thousand watt is standard sun, and uh, we can get to steam condition. So George was uh, uh, also did the work to say desalination because we want we don't want the salt accumulate on surface. But I'm still worried about one thing. I said biofouling. I said how we can avoid biofouling. So he worked with another postdoc who again, was working on another hard to publish a project, but uh, so he got into uh, York University in Canada. Now assistant professor, this is Tom Cooper. And they come up with another clever idea. And the idea is uh, to lift up the absorber. And uh, in this case, uh, pen the black backside with the black uh, uh, pen, and they re-radiate out the thermal radiation in infrared. So it turns out water is very absorbing in infrared. Just a few micron, all the energy is absorbed. So in this case, because water is not touching absorber, so absorber is not pinned to 100 degree. It could get to 150, 160. We can actually get a super heated steam uh, under normal sun. So this is, a, uh, let me show this. Right, so seeing this, so this is a normal uh, solar condition and you get actually super heat. So uh, we're still looking into this, a lot of people are looking into this and uh, uh, the uh, motivations for dissemination. But also I want to say there are really a lot of other work on solar steel. So I, I was saying, why so many people work on it? And, uh, but then something new happened. This was actually a new discovery made by uh, Gui Hua Yu, and they use hydrogen onto this. So they said that uh, the lethane heat is reduced. So this is something new, we're still looking into it. So those are the story I want to tell, but uh, let me wrap up at the beginning. I said that uh, we made the movie, right? I want to show a three minutes movie. And uh, this is uh, related to our research. And uh, sometimes they say we try to have fun. And this is the one that we try to have fun. And the, the title, you can go YouTube, but the title is called The Battle Against Phonons. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a serious problem. Earth is gradually warming up. We need to find alternative energy sources. We should look to the sun for a solution. Well, here is one way. We could use the heat coming from the sun to energize the semiconductor. Do not forget photons and phonons. Some phonons might steal the heat that we need to generate the electricity, and some photons might escape and get lost. We have to leave it 
It is very challenging. We can't even see them. Let's bring out our army of students and postdocs to tackle these problems. Meet the phonons, a strange and microscopic species that lives to steal heat. They take the heat and run away with it unless they run into an obstacle known as scattering. However, even though they die in a scattering event, they also give birth to the next generation at the same time. We cannot see them, but in order to control them, we need to monitor them. Simulation team, your task is to dig out everything possible about them. Spectroscopy team, you are responsible for probing them. Materials team, you are responsible for implementing the design. Photon team, you are responsible for trapping incoming solar photons and keeping photons from escaping. Ice team, work with the materials and photon teams. Generate power for us. According to my simulation, these photons have a wide range of travel and distance. We can use interfaces in materials to limit their travel by placing these interfaces in nanometers apart. It would be nice if we could confirm these ideas. We have a way to probe this by exciting phonons at very short distances so that some of the thermal transport is ballistic rather than diffusive. Today, we are gathered in the lab because I want to show you the great progress we have made. Daniel, please. We took the photon absorber from our photon management group and we combined it with uh, photon transport limited nanostructured thermoelectric materials from our materials group uh, to build these prototypes of, as we call it, STAG, which stands for Solar Thermoelectric Generator. When the sun rises in the morning, the absorber site will heat up and this heat will drive the electrical energy carriers down to the cold side of our stack. This will build up a voltage that can be used to power an electrical device. I knew all along that you young people could make it work. So I hope uh, you had enjoyed that movie we made short. And uh, we really have a star cast. Uh, on the left, uh, some of the faculty, the collaborators. And I want to show, say, Zhifeng Ren is a leading material scientist. And Millie Dresselhaus, uh, down you can see her honors. Keith Nielsen is a chemist. And Maren Suyacek is a physicist. So really, we're multidisciplinary team. That's the nature of research. And, but the young stars, right? This is a two slapshot of this. And among them, four of my former students, uh, Mona, Bolin, uh, Jitin, and Austin. Really, they say this young researchers, they are the explorers, they make things happen. And I want to particularly mention uh, the three women on this picture, right? Millie, she's actually, I say, really my role model. She unfortunately passed away in uh, 2017. And people her, call her carbon queen. Cavalry Prize is a sort of a equivalent to Lower Prize, one million um, prize. Na she won National Medal of Science, National say, Presidential Medal of Freedom. And uh, Mona was a postdoc. So one, one day we had a group meeting and uh, Mona had the babies a week ago and he showed up in my group meeting. And the meeting happened also were at the meeting. So I said, Mona, why you came over? I am see, I was expecting really she should stay at home, right? For months, uh, Chinese tradition. I mean, they, and uh, uh, Millie was not impressed. Millie said, I came back. But Millie had four children, right? And then she said, I came back uh, the next day. And uh, then uh, Zutin uh, also had a baby. She was a graduate student. And half months later, she drove to Argonne National Lab to do experiment. So I want to share this really amazing story. They, it's dedication, and that really make say then they say breakthroughs and come from really this kind of dedication. So my time is up. So let me summarize, and uh, I hope uh, I'm sharing the really the exciting, but 
arduous journey, right? Research is, is arduous, but uh, it's exciting. The journey, it's a sweet when you say after a lot of effort and journey can take you to different directions, right? Failure is a matter of success. Discovery often made unexpected. Ideas originate from knowledge, discussion, failure, trying. Think out of the box with fundamentals in mind. And really to do research, going into a new direction, you need to cure, say curiosity, uh, courage, and persistence. I work on heat, it's an old subject, but it's very important. Energy water is related to our daily life. And we show that even in this traditional field, they're open, they're golden opportunities and the nano make a big difference. But we need to think from nano to micro to terra and really to benefit mankind. So let me again acknowledge my collaborators, former students, postdocs, those are really passionate and uh, you can see the people in red, uh, people in the faculty, and, but say, I'm proud of any, say every one of them in company, start company, working in government apps. And uh, with that, I'll stop here. Thank you. Hey, this is wonderful. Hi, Gang, can you, see, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, terrific. I, uh, such a such a uplifting story. I know many high level stories. We have uh, so many meals together, but at this technical depth, we, we seldom do. Uh, wonderful. So, oh, um, yeah, Alice is uh, projecting um, questions for you. So should we, yeah, let me read this question, read aloud. Uh, so question one from the audience, uh, Professor Chen, thank you very much for sharing your stories of uh, exploration. How about if a student do not ask any questions or someone have uh, unseen, uh, uh, yeah, nonsensical questions anyway, how to guide them to reasonable channel? Uh, that's a very good question. Of course, uh, they, uh, everybody is different. Everyone is different. I think it's uh, important to create an environment that any question uh, is encouraged, right? Sometimes uh, even, uh, uh, you might think it's a nonsensical question, make your head spin, make you say, how I explain it, right? And in that process, of trying to explain things clearly, ideas are generated. And uh, uh, very, we see this uh, so often, right? And uh, I also seen students among my students, uh, some of them uh, really had a, um, say, a difficulty in speaking out and you encourage them. And in the process, I see student, uh, typically a PhD student, a graduate student, they progress and they become more and more talked in. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, this is a question two from the student, from audience. Professor Chen, how to supervise students to overcome hard time during their PhD if their ideas always don't work? Uh, they have no good results. Yeah, uh, as a faculty member, as uh, we all have that kind of uh, experience, right? And uh, there are many times things don't work out. And sometimes you have to step back, define problem better, right? And uh, uh, I try to set up a better defined problem in the first year. So student, I say, okay, if you solve this problem, you sort of also anticipate that they could solve the problem and uh, you, you uh, publish a paper and you learn a process, you build your confidence. And, and so that's a, it's a, so since it doesn't work out, you change direction. I have given uh, quite a few examples, right? Um, in Lu Hu's example, he did experiment. We didn't, we were not, we wanted to push to a smaller distance, 
but they couldn't make it a war and uh, you change the direction. And he actually wrote a, a very influential paper in the new direction. So a uh, direction change is uh, nothing wrong. Great. Question three, dear Professor Chen, the cool fabrics is really cool work. How about the power consumption of this new material? Does it, is it wearable? Uh, so uh, the, the key idea is there's no power consumption, right? It's a passive, it's a ready out the body heat. So we all ready out that the power consumption is your human body, right? We sit here, we have to dissipate 80 watts and that's uh, normally uh, our body metabolism. And of course, the idea is that we can uh, read out the additional heat so you can dial the uh, environment to a higher temperature. And uh, uh, like I said, uh, we didn't get a big funding for that. And Professor Yi Chui at Stanford, and my understanding is actually he started a company on that. So maybe one day you will wear uh, the super cool fabrics or you can make a diameter different that you can make the warmer fabrics. Yeah. Question four, uh, dear professor, solvent extraction uh, for that example, how to connect the technology with the market? Did you encourage the students to have their startup during their PhD? Yeah, uh, this is a, a very good question. And uh, uh, Anurag uh, Bajpay, uh, most of my students want to do uh, a faculty member and uh, I have only a few want to start a company. I actually really want the student who want to start a company because we got a lot of technology lead to be taken to the market. But Anurag is a, is a really interesting example. He wants to start a company and uh, I encourage that at MIT, we do have that environment to encourage a student. And uh, the last year, of his research funding actually came from uh, MIT seed funding. The goal is to take technology out uh, in one or two years. And he realized that. And uh, you can see he was very active. He went to management school to take course, to look for market. And it was through the course they found the market. And with, right, so you got technology, you got people, you got market. That's what make companies successful. Mm -hmm. Question five, Professor Gang Chen, discovery of the traditional field like heat transfer are even harder than choosing new field. What is your comments for your new graduate students to choose research topic? Uh, excellent question, right? And uh, first, uh, uh, those days uh, when students come talk to me, right? I always say, this is what we do, right? Where is your passion? And it turns out to say, because of the problem we work on really is related to uh, daily life, right? You need uh, energy, you need the water, and a uh, very lot of students, very passionate, right? Applying the knowledge to solve problems for humanity. And uh, of course, I say, once you got to, into research, I say you have to get started. So I always advise my students once they come to my group, I say, okay, now you have, uh, you join the group, uh, I have two pieces of advice. Uh, one is get your hands dirty. You will never learn until you do research. And second, I say, keep your breath. You still need to continuous learning. And uh, I don't want a PhD be that narrow minded that can only no, only no one thing, of course. So basically the breath and depth. And so I, I think that uh, with that, and then you keep trying and uh, you come up with new ideas. There are a lot of uh, things, uh, uh, example I give it, right? Sometimes the idea is very much unexpected, right? You can research to plan this idea uh, of uh, say very few times we can plan exactly the idea, right? Say we write a proposal, we have some exciting idea and many times it didn't work. But in the process, we come up with new ideas. Thank you, Gong. I have a, a, a question um, 
about your early uh, career. After you done PhD, I remember you told me you had um, a relatively focused training from as most PhD. Then you gradually really branch out, look at this range of ideas, the theoretical, experimental, computational. I know you're personally involved in many, many details that I know. How did you make this transition in your early days? Uh, uh, that's a uh, very good question. And uh, um, it will take time to really go over. But let me briefly say, when I was, uh, I actually did my master's degree at the Huan University of Science Technology. And uh, I, when I joined my advisor, Chang Lin Tian, he uh, later say, uh, after uh, one year, he became chancellor of UC Berkeley, right? So I, my master's thesis was working on convection and the heat exchanger. And then when I joined Chang Lin's group, uh, he asked me to work on superconductivity. So the first day I came to the group and uh, work on from uh, uh, heat exchanger to superconductivity it was a big jump. And uh, so during my PhD, he was a uh, uh, Berkeley chancellor. He gave me tremendous freedom to really look into different topics. So that developed my sort of curiosity and always learning, uh, keep learning new things. So, so I think the great pleasure of doing research is why exciting is because we're always learn new things. You know that very well, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, is a uh, say. Uh, there, there are many other things uh, that will influence uh, how we get into new research direction. But a lot of times, it's also students. Right? I mentioned that uh, Lu Hu wants to work on renewable energy. I said, okay, why don't you look at lattice wire solar cell, and uh, uh, that's how we get into uh, photovoltaic. Thank you. Alice, I suppose uh, our time is uh, up. Is that right, Alice? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's really great. So yeah, now we're going to deliver a certification to Gang Chen. Yeah. So Professor Chen, yeah, we're really proud of you. And uh, yeah, we want to deliver this. I can add the certification to you for your technology your stories. We really connect the world and the universe. Uh, yeah, that's the electrical version. I will send you to you later for the hard copy. Okay. Yeah. Well, I met you in person. <laughs> yeah. So I see everyone here. Yeah. It's a time for our uh, dialogue part. So today is really a big group. Yeah. It's a lecture group. We have Gang Chen, Zhe Nan, and uh, Zhi Gang, and also Paul here. Yeah. So we want to talk a story about untold story of explorers. I already told a lot of story about and told the stories behind, you know, your discoveries. And now, yeah, I want to hear more stories from others. Okay, Jenna, did you have, uh, you know, stories behind? Yeah, successful life and a successful, you know, technology. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, uh, good morning or good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, good to see everybody virtually and uh, friends uh, all around the world. Um, well, uh, in terms of uh, uh, story, I, I think um, uh, for, for scientific uh, discovery, a lot of time um, we, we did not really uh, expect a kind of, um, uh, when we started research, we, we did not really expect uh, uh, that the research would go the way we, uh, we always kind of anticipated. Uh, in my case, um, uh, in my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, electronic skiing. Uh, actually, the way we started uh, was kind of interesting. Uh, that was um, uh, when I first started in Stanford, uh, after working for eight years uh, uh, in uh, Bell Labs in industry, uh, I was uh, kind of searching for what's the next big thing, because we worked on flexible displays, uh, flexible electronics for, 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 I felt eight years was a long time at the time, because uh, I was uh, still starting my career. Uh, so I was thinking, what's the next thing? Um, and in a coincidence, uh, I, I saw um, uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, from mechanical engineering, uh, Mark Kokoski, uh, his group uh, uh, makes 
uh, robot, uh, robotic uh, cockroaches, and uh, uh, they try to learn how these um, uh, robots can climb up the wall. And it was really cool, and I was fascinated. That was uh, like 15 years ago, and it was the first time I got exposure to, to robotics. Uh, so I asked him, um, well, is there anything that, that um, uh, your robot cannot do that we can help? Uh, so he told me that, uh, well, my robotic cockroach, when it climbs to the top of the wall, uh, it will fall down because it doesn't have uh, uh, the uh, ability to sense. So it doesn't know it gets to the top mm -hmm. when there's nothing to grab. It just falls down. So that's um, that's what gives us the uh, inspiration to think about. Well, can we can we learn from skiing uh, and can we uh, make flexible electronics and now uh, skiing like electronics uh, uh, to to help robots, but more importantly, help people to regain their sense of touch. Um, so so that that's how we got started uh, in, in this whole kind of adventure of uh, uh, skiing inspired electronics. That's the behind the scenes story, I guess. Okay, that's a really good start. Uh, glad to know that. Yeah, so Ji Gang, yeah, you already asked Gang, you know, a lot of questions about uh, yeah, how you know a lot of things. Uh, in my uh, uh, opinion, yeah, I think you know everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you must have a lot of stories for how to, you know, uh, yeah. Well, let me say, say, first say hello to Jenan. It must be very early <laughs> for <laughs> California. Yeah, good to see you. Looking forward to your talk. So, uh, yeah, uh, Gang talked uh, in his talk, focus on uh, his students, his group. Uh, now, I, I also have a lot of students' uh, story. Um, uh, but I, I, let me just talk a little bit about uh, the influence of colleagues. Mm -hmm. So when I started at my first faculty position is uh, at UC Santa Barbara. So for my PhD, I did a very narrow mechanics question. It's called a fracture, interfacial fracture. Some people spend time to bond this and I break it apart and <laughs> test how strong that bond is. That was my thesis. And I was a theoretician. I didn't even get to break the things. I just calculated how things okay. It was uh, extremely narrow, uh, but uh, according to people, it was extremely well done. The thesis work was extremely well cited. I don't know why, but anyway, very narrow-minded. I didn't do a post-op. I went to UC Santa Barbara. Um, uh, it was just a clueless what to do uh, as a faculty. They just don't, don't know what to do. Cannot get myself started. Then a senior faculty by the name uh, 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 Tony Evans, John, I probably know, know him, Tony Evans, he passed away. Uh, he was a, such a brilliant researcher and also uh, very generous, uh, gave me ideas, but in particular showed me how this interfacial fracture I was calculating uh, was related to something real. So two real problems that played out uh, hugely in my career. One was uh, design the ceramic matrix composite. So now actually uh, we were working on this 20, 30 years ago. Now ceramic matrix composite became used in, in engine, high temperature engine for aircraft. It's a ceramic, very brittle. But once you make a composite, you combine two ceramics it become a tough material, as tough as steel. The reason it's tough is because interface is weak. That's connected to my topic. He showed me how, how to do that. Oh, I, okay, but I, I want to be your, 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 your unpaid postdoc. No, 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 it's too late. Uh, you're a young faculty now. You need to find your own work. <laughs> All right, I, I was uh, looking around and I encountered uh, friends at Intel. They're more senior than me and showed me this interfacial fracture is also related to microelectronics. Because in microelectronics, you have so many materials stacked together. One of the key concern was uh, debonding. So I helped them, uh, that work got a lot of attention from industry. So these ideas uh, did not come from me, come from uh, colleagues 
I have uh, many other uh, encounters in later. Uh, uh, so, uh, Janai, you know this. I learned to do stretchable electronics from Sigurd Wagner, right? It's all connected. So, uh, colleagues, wonderful. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Okay, yeah, it's really, really interesting. I see your story, and now I understand why you asked the gun that question. Yeah, so what you did in your PhD, it looks like no amenities. Yeah, Paul, so you travel several, you know, university, and you travel several fields, yeah? You must have a lot of story behind. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe the most interesting thing to share is that it's never a direct path. Right? We try mm -hmm. a lot of different things and it turns out the world is a peak meter. So when you do something uh, interesting and important as we saw in the last talk and as we're about to see, everybody hears about it, but the things that, that don't work, it, it in, you know, in some sense, you learn things along the way, but it ultimately you know, doesn't matter. It doesn't make anyone think less of you. You actually uh, captured something of a new field, for instance, and then uh, we're able to apply that maybe some years later in my I can talk way, way back when before Baidu, I think that was April, right? I, I, I talked about how for 10 years we worked on controlling molecules with membranes, but we had no idea what to do with it. And it wasn't until we moved to UCLA and started interacting with clinicians and people who do bone marrow transplants and cancer immunotherapy that it dawned on us that that was a way to introduce biomolecular payloads into cells to you know, cure diseases. And so you know, one, of the, one of the wonderful things about uh, UCLA is we have all of science, engineering and medicine around one courtyard and we talk to each other all the time. It's the smallest of the UC campuses, even though we have the most people. And so we share problems. I'm sorry, uh, Professor Chen isn't here anymore. It'd be fun to fun to uh, share ideas with him, but, but we're happy that he sent uh, Young Ji Hu uh, to us. And in fact, Young Ji you know, came over to my group soon after he arrived, uh, posed a, a problem, and we came up with a really interesting idea that we're pursuing together that you know, I hope everyone will hear about in the next year. But that, that idea of you know, uh, our inspiration really comes from listening to other people and seeing what their problems are and seeing if we can come up with new solutions together. I think that's where nanoscience has really, uh, by developing communication skills across fields, has really opened up new opportunities for science, engineering, and medicine. Okay, yeah, you mentioned one, you know, UCLA young faculty was Gang's students, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's the came to our next question. Yeah, how do nursing the students, <laughs> yeah? Paul, you remember, yeah, our second yeah. question? <laughs> Indeed, yeah. So we wanted to ask each of you how you select uh, people for your groups. And Professor Bao, maybe we'll ask you to go first because you'll be getting ready for your talk next. And as you know, uh, someone from my group is very interested in the answer to this question. Um, well, for selecting student, uh, um, I, I, uh, I, I like to uh, uh, talk to students first uh, to figure out what they're interested in. And um, I usually uh, do not expect that the students uh, already know a lot mm -hmm. about our field, but I look for students who are curious, uh, who are excited about new problems, and, and who want to just dive in and uh, and learn new things. And uh, and and then if we're both excited about the problem and and uh, there's this um, uh, uh, interest, uh, then we work together and. Um, uh, kind of, uh, I, I also we view that uh, as an advisor, I learn uh, together with my students. Um, uh, so um, uh, if the student um, uh, is able to, uh, to, to navigate and uh, find the uh, uh, search for literature and uh, come back with um, uh, their thoughts, uh, and then I'm the sounding board and I'm the person to discuss with the student, then we figure out uh, What's the path forward? Okay. Super, thank you. Uh, Gang? Uh, 
first, uh, uh, good morning, John, and great to see you online. And uh, um, uh, Jolan already uh, said very well, uh, really talking to students. And uh, I also want to add, say, uh, when I meet a student uh, uh, at the end, I say, I actually have three criteria. And uh, uh, I say the first criteria is motivation, as we all want to motivate students, right? And uh, you motiv you're motivated because you want to work on those problems and uh, say you want to uh, say you have the common interest in. And, and second, uh, I tell students, I said, uh, uh, I want to uh, be really open-minded. And this, uh, this is because uh, uh, the thing we learn when we, we do those things, right? It's very interdisciplinary. All of the people sitting here can right, tell the stories uh, working across the different fields. And uh, I'm in mechanical engineering and students come in, I say, you have to learn heat transfer, you have to learn fluids, you have to learn thermodynamics. But beyond that, you have to learn quantum mechanics, so you have to learn materials, so you have to learn electromagnetics. And I start to learn chemistry. Oh, it's very hard for me now. Hard to remember those things, but uh, uh, it's a uh, it's uh, so this is uh, the open mindedness, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, originally, I only have this tool, and as I grew more and more, I found another thing I, I add, and uh, this is a uh, communication. I say, I am not say because, like, like, uh, Joanne said, we're sounding board, right? You need to learn, you need to communicate, not just with me, but also. You will learn more by communicating, talking to lab mates, talking to other faculty, talking to people around you. You learn faster. So that's sort of, I, I say, before you join, I just want to make sure I deliver this, my sort of expectations. And uh, 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 I'll stop here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I don't know. I don't have a good <laughs> way of uh, uh, picking out students. Uh, so this is a practice. So what I do is I look at their grades. If their grades is too high, I, I need to worry. Uh, maybe the guy is spending too much time. Why? <laughs> but if they're too low, uh, maybe the guy hasn't got his act or her act together to just uh, work. So I, I look out for people, the grades are not too high, not too low. So I, I, seriously, uh, too high is a, is a minus to me. Uh, anyway, um, and then really after students, call, oh, of course, look at uh, the recommendation letters, uh, especially for, for, from people you have some calibration of. Um, then I guess uh, at least in mechanics, um, uh, the good researcher, uh, the characteristics can be quite different. I don't know what are the great characteristics of a good researchers. I don't really know because it's just too diverse. So when they came in, uh, I spent a lot of time. I never had a huge group. Shannon, you had a huge group. I have a small group. I spend a lot of time with students weekly. I try to discover their interest and your, their uh, talents. Also, I actually spend, I ask students for each meeting, I have a weekly meeting or bi-weekly meeting with individuals. I ask a student to propose an idea to me and then I just shred that idea and then ask them to fight back. Uh, so just uh, see, uh, defend their, uh, eventually some students discover their own ideas. So, um, I, I, so it seems to every student Works out fine in the in the in the end. So let me, so that make me sh feel there's not much need to choose a student in the beginning. Uh. <laughs> okay, it is very interesting. So Jigao, your answer was really out of my mind. Yeah, because you you Harvard University, I think you always cut the top, you know, one or two based on the grade. So now you say if the GPA are too high, you worry about that. That minority, yeah, you're too low, you worry about it. Yeah, that's that's really out of my mind. Don, did you pick the student based on the you know GPL? You doesn't matter for that. Uh, I don't look at GPA, I don't look at TOEFL, I don't look at GRE, I talk to students, I look at the letters. So uh, I, I, I have not 
exclusively like a jigong to see if we the students the top one not picking the students. <laughs> no, I have not. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not my criteria to pick students. I just don't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is interesting. So, Jenna, did you automatically kick out the top one? No, <laughs> or pick up the top. <laughs> Like a gun, I also don't look at GPA or GRE. I figured uh, uh, students, uh, if they are admitted uh, to our graduate program, they are all, uh, always uh, one of the best. Uh, um, but the recommendation letter does help. Uh, I guess okay. I'd like to know a little bit uh, about uh, the, um, uh, the how, how the student interact with others uh, and uh, um, uh, how, how they uh, work and, uh, uh, and also when I talk to students, I like to understand their way of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel that the, the way of thinking is something very uh, important. And uh, that's, that's how we think about problems. <laughs> OK. <That's> yeah. <laughs> so Paul, you pick up a uh, number one or not. Or you pick up a base. Yeah. I, I also question. ignore grades and test scores. And I, <laughs> I go immediately to uh, letters of recommendation and then uh, talking to the uh, students. And once upon a time, uh, having good hands mattered tremendously mm -hmm. in our group. And I used to look for people who fixed their own automobiles, but mm -hmm. nobody does that anymore. I have one student who does, uh, and that was a criterion because in the laboratory, you have to make the electronics work and the plumbing work. And when you put something back together, all the parts have to go back in. It's not like you can leave a you know a wheel off in a car and have it work, and so people who did that were used to you know many of the things that we needed to do that were fairly routine. But if you miss any of them, then nothing works, and you're set back a week or a month. Uh, we don't have something like that anymore, and I've been searching for uh, what the equivalent is uh, for the people who build new instruments and new tools. And so if anybody of this very large audience has some ideas, uh, please do share them. Oh yeah, that's that's why I ask the questions with all of you because many, the audience here, they are young students. Yeah, especially in mainland China, most of the students are fighting for their GPA, you know. They try to get the highest school, uh, you know, in the GPA and the GRE and all this, but uh, maybe they're missing a lot of time to training in lab. I think, yeah, uh, the top scientists, the answer here is will encourage students, maybe do more, you know, kind of work, get your dirty hands, right? In the lab, it's more important and get a good re recommendation letter. That's more important you can get to the top group, the top scientists. Okay, yeah, thank you all of you. That's really great dialogue. And I'm looking forward to Jonah's talk. But before Jonah's talk, I think I have a new thing to announce, a big thing to announce. Yeah, today we have all these top scientists here to, you know, see this big moment. I can add the talk, so now it's moving forward. We have another partners. Paul Weiss will be our coordinators on ICAX Talks. Welcome, Paul. Yeah, so P Paul, please. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, Alice. I'm uh, delighted and honored uh, to help you in this adventure and bring the world of science and engineering uh, together from uh, all over. Uh, ICANX has become a phenomenon. Uh, we joined forces from early on to help identify research stars like we see today. Uh, uh, and also uh, rising stars uh, so that we can have scientists and engineers uh, bring their accomplishments and stories to this amazingly large audience, bigger than you know, we would ever see uh, at any conference we visit or any uh, university or research institution uh, we'd ever see. Uh, we, uh, we're excited to have the ACS Nano Rising Star Lectures uh, in this series too. One of the, one of the things we miss uh, with out uh, traveling the world is the ability to meet new groups and to get their work out in the world. So it's, it's wonderful to have this amazing forum for opening up this opportunity to our younger colleagues. And so Alice, thank you for uh, sharing ICANX with me and with, uh, you know, on behalf of all our, our speakers and our audience, uh, thank you so much. 
Okay. Uh, and Welcome, Paul. Uh, and uh, remember, yeah, every two weeks you will get up at the four o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really hard job, you know. <laughs> okay, now, Paul, the stage is yours. You're going to introduce it tonight. Yeah. Very, very good. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm honored to. Uh, introduce my friend and, and colleague, Professor Jinan Bao, who's the chair, and Keiki Lee, Professor of Chemical Engineering at Stanford, and also a Professor of Materials Science and Engineering there. After, as you heard, she began her independent research career at uh, Bell Laboratories. She's known around the